So welcome to today's Contagio Culture and Web webinar. I'm Astrid Hobill, today's moderator and a PhD student in the Department of Art History and Art Conservation. To begin, not everyone is in the same location since this is a digital event. However, I'm in currently in Kingston, Ontario, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm situated on the traditional territory of the Anishina Bay and the Haudenosaunee. I think it's important to go beyond simple land acknowledgements and find ways to stand in solidarity with Indigenous nations across Turtle Island who are reclaiming their sovereignty. For example, there's a legal defense fund that we can contribute to for our neighbors in Tayandanaga who are currently facing legal battles for denying rail access to their lands around this time last year as they supported the Wet'suwet'en. The Contagion Culture Series is a Faculty of Arts and Science collaboration between the School of Policy Studies and language, literature, and cultures department with Queen's Library providing pro substantive support. These talks are live streamed Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. This talk will be recorded. However, unlike some of the previous talks in the series, it will not be uploaded to YouTube, but it will be available to faculty for educational purposes in the classroom. Queen's Contagion Culture lectures help make sense of this pandemic through the expertise and insights of arts and science faculty members. This public-facing series leverages the powerful tools of humanistic analysis to grapple with a turbulent time. This series will continue until the end of 2021 winter term. To ask questions, please submit them by typing them into the Q&A feature that you can find at the lower middle of your screen. And we will ask these at the end of the talk. Today is my pleasure to introduce Ali Na, an assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at Queen's University. Dr. Na is a media scholar focusing on stereotypes of Asians. She examines the queer, feminist, and anti-racist politics of the present by animating the past towards the future. Her talk today is entitled, The Diseased Horde, Anti-Asian Racism from the 19th Century to COVID-19. As a quick disclaimer, this presentation will use profanity. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Na, and I turn it over to you. Thanks, Astrid. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen now. So you will see me get smaller. In February of 2020 in California, a 16 year old Asian American boy was sent to the ER after being assaulted at school. Officials confirmed that the bullying started in reaction to COVID when he was told to go back where he came from. In March in Texas, a father along with his two year old and six year old sons were shopping at a Sam's Club when after they exited, they were stabbed. The Burmese American family were attacked by a man who thought they were Chinese and that they were spreading the coronavirus. In April in New York, in what happened, in what appeared to be an, a hate crime, an Asian woman was doused in acid, burning her face, neck and back. These are only a few of the thousands of reports of anti-Asian hate crimes in the US over the last year. The 45th president of the United States of America has fueled anti-Asian racism during the pandemic using various social media platforms to equate the virus with China and Chineseness by renaming COVID-19 China virus, Wuhan virus, and Kung flu. The now twice impeached former US president has not been alone in his anti-Asian sentiments and they have grown across the globe. In part as a response to this article seen here, Yellow Alert, an article that evoked yellow peril rhetorics which have long existed in the world. In France, anti-Asian racism prompted French Asians to launch the Je ne suis pas un virus, which became a global movement also under the hashtag I am not a virus. The Facebook page for the Brazil's China Sociocultural Institute, Institute is now filled with comments such as Chinese people stop eating poisonous cats. Chinese are inhuman. They disgust me. These transnational sentiments are nothing new as this 1881 comic illustrates. In 1920, Lothrop Stardard, a KKK member and key contributor to the American Eugenics Society said, 
Nothing is more striking than the instinctive and instantaneous solidarity which binds together Australians and Afrikanders, Californians and Canadians into sacred union at the mere whisper of Asiatic migration. Stoddard's right racist and white supremacist statements are unfortunately all too resonant. From the image shown here to the under your breath indictments, I've heard about turban wearing immigrants while riding a taxi in town or in the halls of Queens University about Chinese investors. These ideas of anti-Asian stereotypes have been long pervasive in our society. To analyze the comments that I brought up in the beginning of this talk as a contemporary response to the pandemic misses the ways in which such discourses are a part of a long institutionally solidified media history that represents Asians as a diseased horde. This racist history has focused on three primary rejoinders. One, filth as immorality. Two, Asian eating habits as taboo. And three, Asians as inhumans or animals. I'll be focusing on how these racist tropes have been established and perpetuated through media and solidified in legislation in North America. The US has been the point of origin for many of these racist anti-Asian stereotypes, but they have been mobilized through cross-border movements and easily digested by Canadians and Mexicans, creating what Erica Lee calls a hemispheric Orientalism that commonly defined the Chinese as a threatening invasion. However, since Mexico differs greatly in its legislation of anti-Asian regulations in that it really didn't have the same ones that the US and Canada did, I will only focus on my talk on the US and Canada. I want to note a little bit that there is a, not only a history that begins in the 19th century, but before that. Um, in California, Chinese first immigrated in 1815, um, but to Canada, there was immigration before the establishment of Canada in 1788. Um, many Chinese ended up settling in BC after building a trading post and even intermarried uh, with indigenous folks who lived there. In spite of this long history in North America, Asians are viewed as perpetual foreigners as inassimilable aliens. This is a political cartoon from 1878 of Yao Gaon, the leper who was before the San Francisco MD. I wanna note that this is a real case. Yao Gaon was a leper who was seen by the San Francisco Medical Association However, the ways in which this was carried up into media varied differently from the actual story. And it had essentially three purposes. The media portrayal conflated the one with the many, said that because there was a singular leper, that all Chinese were lepers. Two, it created a fear of contagion with Chinese people functioning as diseased populations. And it did this by stating that the Chinese workers who were in the communities were spreading leprosy. And the third thing it did is it made it of malicious intent. It said that all of the sort of Chinese people who were spreading leprosy, which of course was not particularly true, um, they were doing so on purpose. They were taking jobs after they had been um, infected and they were spreading the disease to white families. Another example of this trope comes from this 1881 political cartoon, A Statue for Our Harbor. You probably can't quite read some of the rays of light that are coming out, but they include the words ruin, disease, immorality, and filth. These are repetitions that have continually been made in the 19th century, they were common in all forms of print media, and they worked to naturalize these characteristics as innate, uh, 
creating a dominant code of interpretation in which at the time and eventually, uh, at the time only Chinese, but eventually all Asians would become to be understood as carriers of disease, as immoral and filthy. Here's another cartoon from 1886. Um, and in this one, the words that are coming out are vice, immorality, and disease. This is a cartoon that begins to do the work of aligning the Chinese with animality, which was a key function of making these stereotypes spread fear as contagion. In the Victoria Daily Colonist, these repetitions were stated to even precede the Chinese people who would have them. In 1907, it said, the inevitable Chinatown of the coast city is dirty, queer smelling, evil, with dozens of little butcher shops hung with unspeakable dried claws and joints and horrible dead things, with staring coolies and rattling voices and silent dark myriad windowed, carefully curtained little courts that hide heaven only knows what warrens. These repetitions of the Chinese as sources of immorality and filth also were very much tied in with eating taboos as the colonist article demonstrates. This is a letter that was circulated to Asians living in the Philadelphia area in March. It takes up the erroneous origins of COVID-19 as being from Chinese eating practices of eating bats and um, pangolins and What's fascinating about this form of racism not, is not its inaccuracy, but rather the, ready, the readiness with which people have taken it up. Uh, the misconceptions about open air markets in Asia, what Western media often calls wet markets, are easily digested because Orientalism is already present in the minds of people who have internalize this idea that what Asians eat is who they are and what they eat is strange and what they eat is diseased. And so this idea was easily spread as a false origin of COVID-19. You can see that the letter here not only indicts Asians for eating bats and pangolins, but suggests that the cure is to set oneself on fire. So this idea of conflating eating taboos with an occupation of death is something that has long been portrayed in these same 19th century um, cartoons. I want to give you one example before returning to them. This is um, something that happened in April. The Michelin-starred Korean Jeju noodle bar was defaced with stop eating dogs. This is a part of a broader phenomenon of vandalizing Asian restaurants and boycotting them since the pandemic started. For example, the lions have twice been smashed at the entrance to Chinatown in Montreal, along with countless Asian restaurants across Canada and the US. In the 19th century, these eating taboos were characterized as ways to make Asians inhuman. This is a good example of how immigration was dichotomized in these political cartoons. So what you have on the left of the screen is imagery which says that Chinese eat rats and therefore are like rats. And this is opposed by the image on the right of the screen, which is of an Irish worker who's coming home to his children and family and eating at a table. This was mobilized as a way to say that the Chinese didn't deserve to be paid enough for living wages because they were animals and carriers of disease. Ultimately, this served to justify poverty um, and also death for those workers who would not be paid enough to eat. 
Um, I'll come back to that very shortly, but I want to move into how this translates into an inhumanity that's been sort of transposed onto Asianness. So this is probably the most prolific of the tropes that I'm covering today in that it's inc incredibly common to go through the print materials of the 19th century and find Asians being depicted as animals. Um, a particularly grotesque example is in the upper right hand corner of your screen where you see um, what is considered an evolutionary uh, chart uh, by, the, by the illustrator saying that monkeys uh, would sort of evolve into Chinese men who would eventually evolve into pigs. Um, and so these types of images were constantly pushed on the public and accepted by the public. So as we talk about 19th and 20th print, print culture, I just want to note that these are not um, individual sort of unique examples. They are um, exemplary of a trend. I know because I've been doing this research for over 15 years and I have looked at so many of the political cartoons and I can say that this is a very strong trend um, in, in those cartoons. Ultimately, this would serve to justify dangerous work, as I mentioned, and death um, as comes with the example of the transcontinental railroad um, and the workings of the railroad in both the United States and Canada. Ultimately, um, even though the vast majority of labor in the US building of the railroads and the Canadian building of the railroads came from the Chinese, they would be erased from this history. Um, and most people don't even know that there were Chinese working on the railroads because all the photographs of the time um, it completely um, omit them and only share white workers uh, on the tracks. What's particularly heinous about this in relationship to the animality is that because Chinese people were considered to be inhuman, uh, they were given the most dangerous jobs on the railroad. There were statements that they had their nerve endings far further from their skin, so they couldn't feel pain. And so they were given the most dangerous jobs for the least amount of pay, meaning that thousands and of them died while working on the railroads. And because of the way in which the railroads were built, many of them ended up being buried underneath the tracks themselves. Um, so as we think about the empire that was created um, for Canada and for the US through the railroads, it's important to know that it's built on the bodies of Chinese men. This theme of the plague of Chinese, uh, the diseased horde, as I called it in the title, is something that is continually replicated uh, throughout this print culture. This is an example from 1878. And here is an example um, from 1880. You can see that Lady Liberty is throwing a, a life raft to these Chinese men who are being depicted as a horde of rats escaping a ship. This image of the Asiatic horde, in addition to being especially pernicious in its racist stereotypes, is built strictly in fear. At the time these images and in the run up to the first waves of Chinese exclusion acts to bar Chinese migration, Chinese people only made up 0.002% of the US population. So these acts included in 1882 in the United States the Chinese Exclusion Act, which it effectively barred Chinese migration. And the, uh, the 1885 Head Tax Act in Canada, which put an, an unreasonably high uh, amount on um, migration and uh, made Chinese people register with, uh, register with the government in order to be a part of the country. Here's an example of a head tax document. In its racism, the, in its racism, these are ideas of Asian invasion, which are not substantiated 
by numbers or by lack of work. Often these rhetorics get picked up in the idea that work is being taken from white workers when in actuality at the time there was a very high demand for workers and there weren't enough workers to actually fulfill that demand. In 1886, the Nanaimo Free Press published a song of John Chinaman and the lyrics do a good job to illustrate what the attitudes that came from this print media were really holding. You've came like a hordes of locusts, John, and spread o'er the land. You fill our streets and houses, John, and leave no room to stand. You work for little wages, John, and live like pigs in styes. In filth and stench, you revel, John, your crimes for vengeance cry. This dehumanization has been a key strategy in anti-Asian racism to justify exclusion and violence. The collapse of these identities um, is important to mention, by which I mean Asian identities. So we've been talking about um, sort of these examples of anti-Chineseness. Um, but I think that Kathy Park Hong puts it well when she says that Chineseness is to Asianness as Kleenex are to tissues. We often use them as a substitute, even when we know that they're not the real thing. And that's another way of saying that Chinese is shorthand for all Asians. And that has not only been the case in terms of everyday interactions, um, but also in terms of legislation. So following the US uh, Chinese Exclusion Act and the Canadian head tax, there was the same logics that were applied to the gentlemen's agreements um, in the US. This was in 1907 and 1908 in Canada. And this was an agreement that limited the migration of Japanese folks to the US and Canada by the same logics of undesirability that had been sort of posed through these media images onto Chinese people. In 1917, the US started the Asiatic Bard Zone, which effectively eliminated all Asian migration except for from Japan under the Japanese um, Gentlemen's Agreement and um, from the Philippines because of colonialism. This was extended through the 1924 Immigration Act, which then effectively banned all Asian immigration. And the rhetorics that were used to demonstrate this were always the same ones that had been used against the Chinese in the 19th century. Canada had its own version of this in the 1923 Canada Chinese Immigration Act, which effectively barred all Chinese immigration. During this period, it's important to note that it wasn't simply exclusion that was happening, but there was segregation in the schools, in the movie theaters, at the pool. There was disenfranchisement in Canada, which wouldn't be rectified until 1949. There were lynchings across the Western states of the United States. There were riots and massacres in both the US and Canada, which often led to the burning of Chinatowns. There was forced sterilization and there was occupational and housing exclusions, often pushing people to the margins of society, both in what they could advance as a place of work and in terms of where they could live. So these tropes that get taken up in the 19th century get continued um, and translated from print culture to filmic culture. And a key example of this is the Dr. Fu Manchu series. It started in 1923, the films did, um, in the United Kingdom. And then in 1929, they moved into the United States where they flourished um, and were very popular until 1943. So I wanna note that these were incredibly racist depictions, which took up the same examples of tropes that I have been sort of already illustrating. Um, often Dr. Fu Manchu was said to be bringing the horde of Asia to come and invade empire. So then why did they stop in 1943? Because of World War II. 
they were incredibly effective at creating anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, and the U.S. government actually approached Hollywood and said, you need to stop making these Dr. Fu Manchu films because we're trying to rehabilitate the image of the Chinese. Can you make something racist about Japanese people instead? So in the World War II period, um, they needed to translate the anti-Chinese-ness onto anti-Japanese-ness. You can see examples of how this was done with animality and hordes here. Um, on the right of the screen, these are political cartoons by the beloved children's author, Dr. Suits, who was incredibly pro the internment of Japanese. Um, and eventually uh, the political cartoons were right in that they got what they wanted. And the Japanese were interned in the United States and in uh, Canada, they were sent to exclusion centers and eventually um, moved inward um, and dispersed across the prairies. So it's important to see how these images translate onto um, a broader Asian-ness. Uh, they get developed in relationship to anti-Chinese-ness, but you can see the image on the left here is an anti-Chinese uh, political cartoon from the 19th century. And the image on the right is an anti-Japanese one from the 1940s. And so you see that the imagery sort of sustains itself and um, continues with these themes of animality and inhumanness. This also meant that they had to try to push back against the anti-Chinese sentiment that was very strong and held widely. And so there were efforts to rehabilitate the image of the Chinese in the eyes of the North American public um, through campaign ads like this and through uh, much more uh, disturbing ones in which the US government tried to teach people how to distinguish the phenotypes of um, Japanese versus Chinese people. So then after World War II, we do get a resurgence of the Fu Manchu films. And I want to note that they come very politically advantageous times to create anti-Asian sentiment. You'll see that they reemerge in the 1960s, and this is because this is when the civil rights movement is happening. And this also is at the same moment that Asian migration is finally able to happen again into the US and Canada. In 1965, the US lifts these immigration quotas, which had effectively banned most of um, Asian immigration. And in 1967, Canada lifts the same restrictions. Then in 1980s, um, we get a resurgence of Dr. Fu Manchu again. And the reason for this is because of anti-Japanese sentiment um, over their growing um, sort of success in the auto industry. Uh, for those of you who know your Asian American history, this is um, when Vincent Chin is murdered. Um, he in 1982, he's murdered by two white men who bashed his skull in with a baseball bat in front of two off-duty police officers um, because they said that people like him, he was Chinese American, um, they said people like him were taking their jobs by which they meant Japanese auto workers. Um, the reason that I mentioned the Chin case is simply that it often gets uh, hailed as not an example simply of violence. I've, talked a lot about different acts of violence that have happened against Asians in North America, um, but as an injustice, uh, because ultimately the murderers would receive probation and no jail time. Again, in the 2000s, Dr. Fu Manchu rises up again, um, which for some people may seem odd, but it makes sense given that this is the exact time when in the U.S. political arena, there's a um, Incre increasing China bashing and um, concerns over the US-China trade deficit. I wanna know something about all of these trends that I'm pointing out. It is inaccurate to collapse the production of these anti-Asian stereotypes with anti-immigrant sentiment. I sort of mentioned this a little bit in the Irish um, cartoon, but also because it's about Asian-ness and how it's distinctive as a point of immigration. I'll give you two examples of this. The first comes from July 4th, 2020. 
in which Michael Lofthouse was eating at an Italian restaurant in Carmel Valley, California. And he began to verbally attack an Asian American family that was celebrating a birthday. He said, um, I'm going to use profanity here. He said, Trump's going to fuck you. You Asian piece of shit. Fuck you Asians. Go back to whatever fucking country you're from. You don't belong here. He followed up with death threats on Instagram. And I think that one thing that's notable about Michael Lofthouse is that he had immigrated himself to the United States from the UK 10 years prior to this. And yet there's a sensibility that white immigration is never immigration. Only Asian immigration is undesirable, which is why it's important to understand this as anti-Asian racism and not simply anti-immigrant uh, sentiments. This is echoed um, in September of 1896, so anachronistically, uh, by George R. Maxwell in the Ottawa House of Commons. He wrote, or he said, while our vices, so to speak, are controlled and molded and influenced to some extent by the higher forces of civilization, the vice of the Chinese are dominant and influenced by the lower forces of barbarism. They are grossly immoral. From the Chinese, we are in constant dread of a return of what might be called the smallpox scare. No self-respecting people care to have the CM of Chinese life dumped in tens, hundreds of thousands into their mists. We white people may not be perfect. I agree we are not, but when you stream, when you have a stream whose source is filth and which flows and over bags of long accumulated filth flowing into the moral life of our people, it stands to common sense that their moral life will become more and more contaminated. I read this not only as an example of how anti-Asian racism was translated from the political cartoons into places of legislation, uh, but also to note that George R. Maxwell was also an immigrant. He had immigrated 10 years before this statement on the House of Commons from Scotland. And so in both of these cases, we get a sense that it's never about immigration. It's always about race. And this was very well said when in BC, when there was debates about whether or not the Japanese should be interned, someone said, well, should we intern the Germans as well? And someone in the crowd shouted, no, Germans are white people. I give you these images not to uplift these men who have made these racist remarks, but as a reminder that the face of racism is not the face that we often imagine. It can be a smiling face. It can be a face that feels common and familiar to us. The example of masks also illustrates something about the tropes that I've been discussing and how it's not about the symbols of difference, but it is about anti-Asian racism. At the start of the pandemic, masks were a sign of disease. They were a sign of disease because Asian people wore masks. Because of the 2003 SARS outbreak, it had become culturally accepted uh, during times of disease and even common colds for many people in many Asian countries to wear masks. In March of 2020, a Korean American woman in New York was grabbed by the hair, shoved and punched in the face, resulting in a dislocated jaw. The perpetrator yelled at her, you've got coronavirus, you Asian bitch. Where's your fucking mask? This is a good example of how even though masks get leveraged as this thing that is different and unfamiliar, it's not the mask, it's the person behind the mask. A month earlier, a woman of Asian descent was assaulted in, on the New York subway for wearing a mask. In August, Asian Canadian Queen student, what an Asian Canadian Queen student was walking on Princess Street downtown when a group of men harassed her saying, Wear a mask, you fucking Chinese cunt. 
I share this story in particular because I want us to know that anti-Asian racism is at our doorstep. It's not something that's far away and it's not something that we've managed to escape. In October, Justin Tang, an Asian Canadian man, entered a store at the Rideau Center in Ottawa and was met by a white man who said to him, being forced to wear a mask makes me want to kill Asians. Through all of these examples, we see that the mask changes. It can be worn, it cannot be worn, it can be worn by someone else, but the anti-Asian racism persists. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a gendered dimension to all of this. Um, this starts off as something that is attached to Asian men, to Chinese men in particular. Um, in an address to the Indianapolis Times in 1878, the Working Men's Party of California invoked an image of genderless swarms of slaves to describe Chinese immigrants. It said that they are in every place. They seem to have no sex. Boys work, girls work. It's all alike to them. These types of statements were mobilized um, in fears of anti-miscegenation and eventually anti-miscegenation laws and a ban um, in Canada on hiring white women. You can see that the images here depict a threat to white women, always as the victims of the uncontrolled sexuality from um, an often effeminized uh, other in the Asian. What's interesting about this is that these same modes of gendering often are in contrast and direct opposition to some of the other tropes that we've discussed, namely that of filth. Um, in the context of the railroads, it was written about the Chinese men that they were effeminate, that they were like women and that they should not be given any noble jobs on the railroad. And the justification was that they bathed too often, that they were too clean. In fact, that sometimes they would put um, soaps and, and floral um, things in the water that they would bathe in and it would make them smell like a woman. And so this cleanliness then gets posed against what is grit, what is American and Canadian grit, white grit. So it's important to know that these uh, tropes oscillate and that they change over time. In 1875, the Page Act did a lot to solidify what would become a common trope in media of the Asian woman as hypersexual, as uh, immoral, as always a prostitute, essentially. Um, it banned most Asian women's immigration to the United States and subjected the women who did come to um, tests of purity in which they were stripped and, and checked um, for sexual impurities. Um, the, an image in the upper left hand corner is of Angel Island. Um, the Immigration Center. And I have also included some images of um, Anna Mae Wong, uh, who is in the lower left corner. And on the right, we have Nancy Kwan. These are two um, Asian American actresses who uh, played roles that solidified this trope in Hollywood and have become the dominant mode of seeing women, um, Asian women, as hypersexual. This is particularly important um, to understand within uh, hate crimes in, that are happening now because they are more than two and a half times likely to be directed at Asian women and often result um, in a sense of ownership over Asian women on the part of white men. An example of this comes uh, from uh, a Filipina uh, Canadian woman in Edmonton who was attacked uh, by a white man after um, turning him down in his, uh, his sexual advances, uh, at which point he began to physically attack her and tell her to go back to China and said that she should stop bringing Corona to Canada. So you can see that these hate crimes uh, come together in a way that uh, collapses ethnicities that uh, is particularly gendered and that repeats the long history of racism. Um, I have a lot more examples that I wanted to show, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there for time so that there is the ability to um, have questions.
Thanks, Ali, for your presentation. Um, wow, it, there's just a lot of horrific depictions out there. Um, and I'm sure so many more that you didn't even get to. Uh, we currently have one question already. Oh, we're getting more as we come in. Um, the first one is, given that you're in film and media, how do you think that this field or the film industry can utilize, be utilized in fighting these harmful stereotypes against Asians? That's a great question. Um, for me, uh, I think that this is the question that animates most of my scholarship. Um, I know these histories really well because I want to show how some work that's being done by Asian diasporic makers is resisting these stereotypes. Um, and so I like to share these histories in order to show what's being sort of pushed back against this. Um, I think that in Hollywood, we're really far off from any form of this. I mean, it's important to note that there have been three major Asian American uh, casts um, in like US filmic history, and they've all been about 30 years apart with the most recent being Crazy Rich Asians 30 years before that, it was um, the Joy Luck Club and 30 years before that, it was the Flower Drum Song. And so these depictions of Asian Americans and Asian Canadians, I think can work to push back against this, but only if there's more of them. And I think that for me, it's less important that each one be perfect and more important that they be proliferated because there's never going to be a perfect counter to all of these tropes. Um, in fact, uh, sometimes by trying to create a perfect counter, you create a new trope. And so the important thing is to proliferate images, um, positive and dynamic images of Asian diasporic people in North America. And with that answer, you have basically answered the second question, which was, do you think that these movies showing a predominantly Asian cast, which are becoming more common with crazy rich Asians, and they also mentioned Mulan 2020, are helping to dismantle the harmful stereotypes or like creating new stereotypes? So good. I did um, a talk back actually last year or something like that on Crazy Rich Asians. And um, I think that there's a lot to be said about Crazy Rich Asians perpetuating problematic stereotypes. I mentioned how people sort of use Chinese investors as code for anti-Asian sentiments, even amongst liberals. Uh, and this kind of movie does that work. But it was also, I think, dynamically important for many Asian Americans um, I jokingly said to the audience, uh, I am Rachel Chu. Uh, you know, I went to NYU and now I'm a professor giving a big talk in front of all of you all. Um, and I think that those images are important. I think I, I've just, I recently taught media and the arts, Asia and Asian North America. And I had so many Asian, um, Asian Canadian students uh, tell me with, you know, heart wrenching <laughs> sadness that there, that the lack of representation has um, often led to internalized racism for them and that it was so freeing to even see one image of themselves um, depicted in media. And we have a, another question. It says, hi, Ali, it's Karen. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm wondering what you think of the cultural and political reception of Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam in the media and by particular politicians, um, as she's also been on the end of anti-Asian racism. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, I think that, oh, I forgot who it is now um, because my um, my Canadian brain is not all the way on. I've only been here for two years. I'm, I'm, I'm from the US, um, but uh, there was a politician in Canada who said, who is she working for? Is she working for China or is she working uh, for Canada? And I think that this type of um, sort of skepticism is mobilized very well because there's this idea that Asians are always foreign. Asians can never be assimilated into culture. Oh, I didn't even get to the last image on my slide. I would really love... <laughs> <laughs> to show that if it's okay, um, yeah, because definitely. I think that it does a, re a lot of work um, to sort of um, to talk about this. So this here is the um, Canadian $100 bill. Um, the scientist who's featured here in the center was originally an Asian woman. 
Um, but after uh, some sample groups in, Charlotte, uh, in Charlottetown and Montreal who said that an Asian woman couldn't represent uh, Canada and was indeed um, exclusionary, it, she was removed and um, a Caucasian woman was re replaced her. And this is this idea that Asians are perpetually foreign to places like Canada, to places like the U.S., in spite of the fact that uh, Asian migration has existed since before the establishment of these, these nations as states. And so this is a really good example of how that kind of um, same idea of Theresa Tam not being able to be Canadian um, comes into play. Mm -hmm. We had someone indicate in the chat that um, it was one of the contenders for leadership, um, Derek Sloan, who indicated that, who has since been removed from the caucus for accepting money from white supremacists. So it really goes to show you how deeply intertwined that is. It's not surprising um, to me. No. I was also wondering um, myself with social media, do you find that there's kind of a bit more of a democratization of the platforms, which allows kind of Asian Canadians and Asian Americans to push back themselves more um, against these stereotypes? I was thinking in particular of uh, Clarence Kwan, who um, is under in Instagram goes under the god of cookery, and he specifically looks at kind of anti race or anti um, Asian racism within cooking, and how it's perpetuating kind of comes out about like the appropriation of Asian cooking. Um, but do we kind of see that as a broader trend, and do we think that it's actually big enough that we're um, seeing pushback there? I think um, the digital sphere is um, is a place that uh, creates opportunities and that it does so without any sort of politics in mind. That means that it can be a place for amplifying uh, alt-right hate speech or a place for, yeah, Asian diasporic people to um, really be seen. Uh, I think that it's Asian diasporic people on the internet are really interesting in a way because um, if you look at like YouTube influencers, for instance, there's a really high number of them that are Asian diasporic um, in, in North America and, um, and from the Canada and the US. And so it has been a productive platform for a lot of people, but I don't think that that's a reason to say that the internet is somehow going to undo a history of racism. Uh, we have another question. Hi, Ali, Suzanne here. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. Can you talk about how media artists like Paul Wong from Vancouver, for example, are using similar archives to those you use to generate meaning intergenerational correspondence and community building and how this might be a companion type project to your analysis? Yeah, I am. I'm trying to remember if I, I know who this person is um, or not uh, that you're specifically talking about. Um, uh, so and while I try to think about that, I, I don't think I do know who this person is that you're talking about. Um, but I think that this is the most productive place in my mind. I mean, I'm biased. I tend to study uh, media artists and I think that there are amazing things that are being done um, looking at um, how we can sort of shift a lot of these uh, types of narratives through this. Uh, there's this great, I'm going to just show you a book that's like in my office because I, I didn't plan on sharing any of this, but there's some great ones that, um, here's, here's a good example. Um, I don't know if you can see that. That's Banff though. Um, and uh, this idea that these artists are taking these places uh, that have been used to sort of create a white empire and identity um, and uh, proliferating them in uh, different ways to ask about the question of Asianness. So um, based on that image, this is um, Jin Mei Yoon's um, replication of it. I, this is kind of terrible, but um, 
it takes the same images of you know these Canadian landscapes that have um, sort of served this uh, settler colonial idea and um, ask what happens when we proliferate the images of these Asian Canadians on them. Um, so I think that there are great uh, works that are being done and are doing really pushback, but most people don't know about them. And so that's, uh, I think, a concern that I have and also something that often draws me back to pop popular culture because it just has so much more reach. Definitely. Um, so another to NT asks if anti-racism is somewhat separable from, or anti-Asian racism is somewhat separable from a wider different base of um, racism or anti-other. And have you kind of seen this at all, or is it kind of? I so I think that that's an interesting question. I think it absolutely functions differently. Um, so. Uh, I do comparative race studies, um, mostly out of the US. I'm, I can't speak as well to the Canadian context um, on this question. Um, but I can tell you that my goal here is not to say that anti-Asian racism is worse. I don't think it is. I, I think that you, I mean, if you think about the, the goal of, of anti-Asian racism in North America is like exclusion, othering, and violence. Um, but that's different than something like anti-Black racism or, um, you know, sort of um, uh, anti-Native American, anti-Indigenous um, types of racism that have really been about, like, killing the other. They've been about extermination. And so the, these are different. Um, they function differently. They often relate to each other. They're often used um, to pose uh, each other against one another. Um, and these are that's a really complicated question. I, I could do a, a few talks on that. Um, but I'll just say that it is different, but that's not to say that it's worse. Um, it's just to say that it functions in a unique way. Thanks. Um, and then someone else has asked that or has indicating that a lot of Queens uh, students often argue with this person that Asian Americans are perceived as weak and don't know how to fight back back racism. So Asians deserve to be discriminated against. I think it's not wrong in a sense because the false representations of Asian people that portray this and there she's wondering if there's also kind of as long as, as well as disease being kind of tropes that uh, are um see Asian people as weak. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this, there are multiple tropes that out, at work there, there's sort of like the obedient Asian um, and um, the passive uh, Asian, and, and these get taken up in, in different modes throughout history. Um, now, it's somewhat complicated because there are um, there are real trends that we can talk about politically, in which uh, there has historically been sort of a, a less of a political presence. Some sometimes these these trends are very much overstated. Um, they're overstated to the point where we think that Asian Americans and Asian Canadians haven't been politically active, which is not true. Um, but there, these types of trends exist. Um, and in some ways, I think that they can create feedback circles with these tropes. Um, so they sort of become self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, it's interesting, the, uh, so Tanya Tran, who is the Queen student who I mentioned, um, sh she uh, shared uh, what happened to her in Kingston on, um, on social media. And uh, a lot of people um, who were sort of relating back to that said, well, I didn't want to share because I didn't think that I was supposed to. And I think that this is different than being weak. I think that this is a sense of like almost not wanting to share because they think that it's not valid. Um, and I think that this happens in particular because most people don't really think there is anti-Asian racism. And so when you operate in a culture like that, then I think that it can be hard for people to express how these things happen. And that probably also ties into a bit to the idea of kind of the model minority and not wanting to kind of rock the boat at all or whatnot. So the model minority, which is a myth, which is like yeah. a, a trope that has been created. It's interesting, yeah. you know, even John McDonald uh, ha, uh, sort of um, speaks to this model minority myth. Um, it's usually used as like a wedge, culturally speaking, but also as a way to 
yeah, to sort of instantiate this idea, don't, don't do bad things, be the model minority. Um, there's another one that says, hi, Ali, my name is Carol and I'm a student from the University of Illinois. Do you think we need more Asians to be in positions of power, example, executives, billionaires in North America compared to Indians and American and Jewish Americans who are also minorities that have higher average income? What do you think we can do to improve our community? Um, I think I think having the right kinds of, of people in, in places of power, people who are committed to anti-Asian uh, racism being something that we work against, but also are committed to being anti-racist um, in other situations. Um, I think that the best thing that can happen for you know Asian American and Asian Canadian sort of populations is is working in solidarity to fight against racism and not um, to become siloed um, in this. My talk comes from a place of of wanting people to understand this history, um, but you know my broader work is very much um, is about comparative racial understandings, and so I think that that's really important for the Asian American community as well, um, especially because there have been sort of um, a lot of instances in, in going both directions of interracial hate. And I think that that all works in the aid of white supremacy. And so it needs to be a collaborative effort. Thanks. Um, and given that we're quite close to five, we probably only have room for one more question and we've got one more currently in the chat. Um, and someone's wondering if you can speak to how we choose uh, Darcy Island project and the representation of disease Asians. I'm sorry, can you, where is that at? Can you read that again? To it's, me? Um, it's in the chat. Um, okay. And it says, can you speak to how we choose Darcy Island project and the re representation of disease Asians? I, I definitely cannot because I am not familiar with it. Um, and so I, I would love to look that up and, and learn more. Um, I think that there have been a lot of really, I don't know if this is a new project, but I can say that there's a lot of really good work that is being done uh, right now. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll look it up and get back to you. Sorry, um, maybe you could email me. My email is ali.na at queensu.ca. Um, and um, maybe we could have a discussion about that. Um, but thank you all so much for all of these questions. And anybody who uh, had a question but didn't get to you know, ask it is welcome to email me as well. Well, thank you, Ali, for this talk. Um, as someone put in the chat, it was definitely chilling. But I think it also shows us that it's not just kind of a, uh, like this anti-Asian sentiment coming at uh, COVID is not just coming from nowhere. There's this long, unfortunately, this long history of it that we've seen and hopefully we can, through different representations, it can work to be dismantled. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming as well. And um, just want to remind everyone that there's a lecture next week on February 9th. Um, and that one will be Images of Fear, the Use of Photography by 19th Century Anti-Vax Movement. And thank you all and have a good evening.